you very much. Welcome, sir. I'll be reading what I tagged uh, welcome remarks and keynote address. And I'm deliberately reading this first so as to set the tone and to provide a background for the Lord, the chairman, who will be making his own speech subsequently. As well as, no, no, my Lord, the chairman will be speaking last after everybody has spoken. I didn't know I wasn't putting on my glasses. <laughs> I just noticed I wasn't seen properly. <laughs> it gives me pleasure to welcome you all to this workshop. Let me begin by expressing our gratitude to His Lordship, Honorable Justice Ayu Bello, the Chief Judge of the FCT, for his presence at this event and for championing the reform of criminal justice administration, not only in the FCT, but in the entire country. I think we should give my Lord another applause. <laughs> you will see why I said my Lord's work is not restricted to the FCT. You will soon get to know more about that as we proceed to the um, piece of this workshop. Secondly, we pay a special tribute to the Right Honorable Dr. Ali Ahmad, former member of the House of Representatives, former chairman of the Justice Committee of the House of Representatives, who, as you were told earlier on by the Master of Ceremony, was the one who sponsored the Administration of Criminal Justice Bill as a private member's bill in the House of Representatives. Thank you. I also want to thank the leadership of our branch, the Unity Bar, for collaborating with our center in mobilizing the participants for this workshop. I've had the honor of working closely with the new chairman, Dr. Evelyn Hawa Shekarao. Both of us, along with other consultants, traveled the country in 2018 and 2019 to review the projects of the European Union Rule of Law and Anti-Corruption Program, ROLAC. I can therefore testify to her undiluted commitment to access to justice, human rights, including gender equality and the rule of law. The unity bar is fortunate to have her as a chairman at this time. I know her dynamism. I know the, the power that she can bring to the Nigerian bar. And you will see it shortly. In fact, this event is one of the outputs that she has begun to generate for the bar. And there will be more of them. I'm grateful to her, to her executive, for appointing me to chair the Committee on Anti-Corruption. Thank you very much. I wish to use this opportunity to send a congratulatory message to the newly elected national leadership of the Nigerian Bar Association. I congratulate the winners of the various positions. I salute others for summoning the courage to stand for national elections of the Bar. That alone is a feat which many will not dare to try. How we can all be winners. I appeal to those who are successful at the NBA national polls to be magnanimous in victory by offering the olive branch to their co-contestants. I urge us all to bury the hatchet and join the winners to move the profession forward. That way, we can all become winners. That way, the success of the Nigerian Bar Association as a, as a collective can become the success of all of us. Let us put the past behind us, downplay our personal interests and ambitions, 
elevate the interest of the collective and join the noble quest for a viral, progressive, and united bar. The task before the new leadership is gargantuan. This includes rebuilding the unity in the profession, rebuilding unity in the profession, repositioning the profession as an agent of change, reforming the electoral process of the association, and gaining trust of the members of the association, as well as the trust of the general public. The new leadership must therefore encourage everyone to come on board and make their contributions. Before delving into the business of today, it is necessary to provide some historical background which will help the participants to understand the deliberate focus of our center on the Administration of Criminal Justice Act. I will do this by telling our learned colleagues, my learned colleagues here present, a story which I call the Adja story. And when I finish, there's going to be a short video clip of about a few minutes, which will you know, demonstrate the story I'm about to tell you now. Why am I telling you this story? I'm telling you this story because it will encourage you anytime you face difficulties or challenges in life. I have told this story several times. Please bear with me if you have heard it from me before. But I need to tell it so that our young friends at the bar can begin to determine what role they want to play in shaping the future of this country. You have heard the, 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 the contributions of these eminent personalities. You have heard their contributions. And the reason why we decided to present all of those is not to show off, but to let you know that you can do something for your country. You can choose to be a contributor to, the, to, the, to developing the country, rather than being just a consumer. In our sector, we can help to develop our sector. In 2003, I was appointed as a special assistant to the Honorable Attorney General of the Federation under President Olusegun Obasanjo's administration. The first Attorney General under whom I was privileged to serve was Chief Akin Olujimi, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Commander of the Order of the Niger. A highly successful legal practitioner and a hard worker, Chief Olujimi handled most of the tasks in the office of the Attorney General personally. His normal closing time in those days was 12 midnight or 1 a.m. I had to adjust to his working pattern. Of all my colleagues in that office, only a few of us used to wait on the HAGF after all others had gone home. That can be understood because how can a man be working and closing at 1 a.m. almost every day? But that was his life. As he was always busy doing most of the official jobs by himself, writing letters and so on, I had to find other things to keep me busy productively in that office. That was how I came into justice sector reform. Mr. Wale Fapunda, then leader of the Legal Resources Consortium, and who later became the Honorable Attorney General of Equity State, and Mr. Chinoye Obiagu of leader, were already very active in the civil society, championing all kinds of reform. During one of our conversations, they came up with the idea of how to reform the justice sector. That was how we decided to establish the National Working Group on the Reform of the Administration of Criminal Justice around 2004. We put the working group together, and the Honorable Attorney General of the Federation, Shiva Kilijimi, approved it. Chinoye was the chairman while I was the secretary. We chose Chinoye because of his vast experience in development lawyering. Government did not provide funding for the National Working Group. Even though it was a time of boom, 
Many officials were not really keen because they were not sure of what the committee was doing. In fact, some reasoned that there was no money for the project. We approached the MacArthur Foundation for support. They sponsored the work of the working group, the, task, the assignment of the working group. The committee was able to travel around the country to hold consultative meetings, and then we produced the draft of the Administration of Criminal Justice Act, the very first draft. After I left the ministry, the Center for Sociological Studies, which we had established in 2006, but kept in abeyance, swung into operation. Through it, we continued to push for the passage of the Administration of Criminal Justice Act. Mohamed Belu Adoke, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, a former classmate, later became the Honorable Attorney General of the Federation. He established a panel on implementation of justice reform in 2011. Mind you, this work started in 2005, 2004. I was chosen as the coordinator of the subcommittee on criminal justice reform, while my lord, Honorable Justice I.U. Bello, was the chairman of the overall panel on implementation of justice reform. He was then a judge of the Federal High Court. He later became the chief judge of the FCT. With his leadership and that of several others, the Administration of Criminal Justice Act got passed in 2015. I think we should give my Lord an applause. <laughs> that remains the greatest intervention in the criminal justice system of our country till date. Most of the innovative provisions in the AGA were developed by that committee and inserted in the law. The ACJ bill was sponsored in the House of Representatives by Honorable Dr. Ali Ahmad and in the Senate by distinguished Senator Dahiru Umar. We are thankful the Administration of Criminal Justice Act has been adopted in about 31 states of the Federation. <laughs> and the remaining states are in the process of adopting the law. You and I are here to engage in serious discussions about how we can be part and parcel of the process of implementing the various provisions of the Act. And that's what we're going to be engaged in in the next few days. It suffices to say, um, the various innovations in the Act will form the subject matter of the discourse at this workshop. It suffices to say that due to the innovations, the Act has rightly been described as revolutionary. In the words of an eminent scholar and jurist, Honorable Justice Professor M.A. Owade, Justice of the Court of Appeal, the Administration of Criminal Justice Act is the hottest law in the country at the time it came out. That's what he said. As, as the proposers combine the provisions of the two principal legislations, the Criminal Procedure Act and the Criminal Procedure Code, into one principal federal act, which is intended to apply to all federal courts across the entire federation. And indeed, a revolutionary intervention in our justice system, justice delivery system, excuse me, a revolutionary intervention in our justice delivery system that ostensibly will impact on the quality of justice and avoid delays in the adjudication process in Nigeria, end of quote. It is, of course, nothing less than all of the above descriptions. Undoubtedly, it is the greatest improvement on previous legislation on procedural laws and administration of criminal justice, including administration of criminal justice repeal and reenactment law of Lagos State 2011, end of quote. However, Several years after the coming into effect of that act, the criminal justice system continues to experience delays and congestions. The campaign promises of the incoming president, Olumide Apata, inspire some hope. Let us seize this opportunity to remind him of one of them. The MBA, quotation begins, the MBA under my administration, this is uh, Akata speaking, the MBA under my administration 
shall also partner with the statutory bodies such as the Nigerian Judiciary, the Legal Aid Council, the Nigerian Bar Association, Legal Aid Council, Nigerian Police, Nigerian Correctional Service, and other stakeholders in the Nigerian criminal justice sector, as well as international partners, donor agencies, to undertake a holistic reform agenda of the criminal justice system, end of quote. The Center for Social Legal Studies commits to working with the NBA in the area of criminal justice reform and allied areas. I therefore wish to shift attention to the role of lawyers in making this beautiful law functional, your role and my role. The provisions cannot be properly implemented without the cooperation of the legal profession. Put in another way, the effectiveness or otherwise of the ADJA depends on the legal profession, judges, registrars, prosecutors, and legal practitioners. For example, without the cooperation of these actors, the ADJA provisions or speedy trial cannot be successfully implemented. It is saddening to note that despite the provisions of the ADJA, there has been no significant reduction in the population of awaiting trial inmates in the country. The releases recently have been due largely to the unrelenting efforts of the Presidential Committee on the Reform and the Congestion of Correctional Centers, of course, which is again chaired by my Lord, the Chairman. I dare say that the legal profession has only been able to secure the conviction of only a handful of high-profile defendants and politically exposed persons. Our center is currently monitoring about 25 high-profile corruption cases in the courts, in the Federal High Court, in the FCTI Court, Lagos, and the Federal High Court, Lagos, and in Abuja. We are monitoring 25 cases. We are keeping them under our radar. We have discovered that these cases are not progressing at all. These cases have been stuck in the courts for almost four years, despite the provisions of the Administration of Criminal Justice Act for speedy trial. In other words, the improvement in the criminal procedure law and the increasing number of lawyers and senior advocates of Nigeria on a yearly basis has not translated to a greater effectiveness of the criminal justice system, greater access to justice by the poor, or improved justice delivery in the country. Although more courts are being established and the legal profession is growing by the day, there is not much to write home about justice delivery in our country. Indeed, the increasing rate of antisocial behavior and criminal activities all over the country, such as banditry, kidnapping, insurgencies, corruption, and resurgent anti-democratic harmful practices which threaten our democracy and collective existence are partly traceable to the inability of the entire legal profession to fashion creative solutions to the challenges of the society. Unless the legal profession reinvents itself and return to its original nobility and integrity for which it was reputed, the confidence of the majority of Nigerians in the profession will continue to decline. The leaders of the profession must be worried that many young lawyers are out of work and several others who are working are poorly paid. Clients now prefer to pay bribes to officials, including law enforcement agents, agencies, rather than pay decent legal fees to hard-working lawyers. That should not be so. The experience of lawyers in other democracies is that lawyers thrive better in an atmosphere of respect for the rule of law. Lawyers tend to be more prosperous when the national economy is vibrant and booming. But when lawyers fail to make meaningful contribution to development of the political economy and become allies with wrongdoers and political paymasters, our legislature will be filled with persons who ought not to be there. The legal system loses its capacity to punish wrongdoing by the big man or the political elite the law and legal system are undermined and the entire society, including lawyers, suffer. I therefore urge that we lawyers must see the law beyond the narrow confines of our personal economic interest. We should apply ourselves, not merely to the task of using the law to defend our clients, we should also contribute to the task of developing the 
the criminal justice system and the legal system generally through development lawyering. Development lawyering is a practice whereby lawyers serve as agents of change and development. This role is not necessarily in conflict with the survival needs of lawyers. A development lawyer is mindful of his place in history. He will not engage in practices which can damage the integrity of the justice system. He does not allow the pursuit of filthy locker to, buy, to blind him into engaging in practices which clearly run counter to the progress of the country. A situation where a lawyer allows himself to be used as a conduit to launder money by politicians leaves much to be desired. A situation where prosecutors receive bribe to compromise the case of the state undermines the quest for accountability. When the legal system loses its capacity to respond to wrongdoing in a way that can deter offenders, it breeds lawlessness and impunity, which are antithetical to social progress and development. There are numerous provisions in the Administration of Criminal Justice Act which can be used to advance the developmental needs of justice sector and the national economy. We as lawyers must get involved in giving effect to the innovation provisions of the, of the Act. It is disheartening to note that some lawyers have developed new tactics, but new but reprehensible tactics for unduly delaying court proceedings, especially when it comes to defending high-profile corruption charges involving politically exposed persons. They embark on writing petitions against proactive judges who take firm control of their courts and who refuse to be compromised. In one case, a petition was written against a judge who was accused of being too fast in conducting the trial of a case. How ludicrous. Other delay tactics include indiscriminate applications to recall prosecution, prosecution witnesses, protracted cross-examination of witnesses, ap applicable, uh, applications to call unavailable witnesses whose presence may not really be needed, but calculated to sensationalize trials of high-profile politically def exposed defendants. As this, all these uh, dilatory tactics continue to frustrate the due administration of justice. Some prosecutors are equally not happy matters when they go to court without adequate preparation for their cases. The legal profession must unite to reverse the downward slide by the profession and the criminal justice system, manifested in the palpable inability to conclude cases bordering on accountability initiated against high-profile defendants. There is urgent need not merely for continuing legal education, but re-education and reorientation of investigators, prosecutors, defense lawyers, and even judges. It must be understood that the legal profession is not merely a means of livelihood for lawyers. It is also a veritable platform for contributing to the developmental needs of the country, building a better and just society for the greatest good of the greatest number. The task of reinventing our profession must begin in earnest with a reflection on the quality of our contributions to the development of our country. The MBA must take the front seat in demanding serious reform and transparency in the mode of appointment of judges. As judges cannot speak for themselves, the MBA and the body of senior advocates must take up the government on the issue of poor working conditions of judges at all levels of our courts. It is absolutely unacceptable that the salaries of judges and justices have remained frozen for about 13 years. That is a big shame. Meanwhile, the salaries of politicians keep changing almost every day. We don't even know how much our, our legislators get now. We are told it's in the region of millions. And yet, you have kept judges on the same scale of salary for 13 years, and you are loading them with work every day and expecting them to perform to their up to, uh, up, uh, utmost ability. I don't think that is rational. I don't think that is reasonable. So we lawyers must take up that campaign. Many hard honest and hard-working ju justices go into retirement without assurance of a decent accommodation of their own. Indeed, the retirement benefits of some judges are delayed for, for an unreasonable length of time, and they are nothing to write home about. No however, no matter how well-crafted our laws are, their purposes cannot be realized without a competent and well-resourced judiciary. The MBA, of which we are all members, must therefore wake up from his slumber and take a more active role in championing the cause of our brothers on the bench and of our, and of our 
uh, colleagues, the junior colleagues at the bar. The MBA must put its house in order and rise up to the challenge of protecting hard-working judges, investigators, and prosecutors from the political class and high-profile defendants who will go to any extent to weaken, intimidate, or compromise the criminal justice system. In closing, let me once again thank my Lord, the Chairman and special guests. I also thank our learned friends and the media representatives who are here present. I, like I cannot say no. And for a double reason that it is for the new brides in Nigeria, the revolutionaries, I said I will certainly be here. So on behalf of myself, I greet you all. Um, this issue of administration of justice in Nigeria is at its lowest ebb. We are in the middle career of exiting. Some of us are here, but you are upcoming. When I graduated at the law school, my head was hot. We're going to change the world using the law. I, I don't think I believe so today that I can change the world using the law. But that is I, the idea. In the U.S., in America, in UK where we copied this law, you change the world using the law. But Nigeria has been stagnant. All what we know is that if there is a new law today, you will be told uh, section 1, section 1, 2, 1, 3, constitution is supreme, as if we're the only country that has that have a written constitution. All other countries not even those operating presidentialism, even the, the Westminster models that have written constitution. Section one applies, so it's not new that uh, there is no law that should, I mean, it's not, must we stand, must we be stagnant? In Nigeria, we've, we have achieved one thing, but we haven't moved forward. Personal liberty it will be very difficult, even for a military regime, to trample on it. We've achieved that. We've passed that stage. But we haven't gone far since then. We haven't. And um, we're very lucky to have people like uh, my lord here. I mean, he's one of the few reform-minded judges that I have seen. Uh, Professor Akisha, I mean, he's true to type. He's not a typical lawyer. Lawyers have turned this profession into a organizing profession. Just go there, make money, and that's it. That's not what they taught us. That's not, that's not the function of a lawyer. The function of a lawyer is to change the system, the society. And so I will thank Prof for not getting tired, for doing things like this. He always calls me for things that are so important to me. Professor Fisher George, for this beautiful edifice which houses the Center for Sociological and Legal Research <coughs> Forum, where we are today for the purpose of this seminar. Congratulations. <laughs> it may not be unnecessarily letting the cat out of the bag. But I think it is right, since you are told I'm already buying out. Already I have been admitted to this center. 
and I have my office ready. Once I bow out, I will just cross and occupy my office here. I must say that uh, Professor Akinshe George is a personification of Nigeria's interest in attaining excellence within the realm of justice administration in this country. He has done so much and is still doing a lot. Before I get into the real menu, let me say on a lighter note that when I looked at the nature of the participants, I quietly whispered into the chairperson of the unity, but I said, you are truly a replica of your interest physically and intellectually. Looking at the females, lawyers that are here, you are really gender sensitive. She quickly made a head count and then responded in whispers that, my lord, next time I will ensure gender balancing. I said, fine. Thank you so much. Well, coming back, let me address the preliminary issue raised by Professor Akinshe George S.A.N. regarding the immediate concluded election of the Nigeria Bar Association and the manner the outcome is. It shouldn't be a reason for divisiveness within the NBA. It shouldn't be any source of rancor and disunity. Rather, it should be a form of encouragement to bring about some forms of innovations Let's embrace the outcome and move together as one. Let me give you an illustration of what I want to happen. I have my young ones, my children who are lawyers, and I feel by retiring, and I'm anxious to go. Please don't move any motion for me to stay for. I can sit at the back, back seat, and allow my children to take to the steering. So that from the back seat, I can tell them, this is a bend. Put your tropicator and slow down. You are approaching some potholes or some bumps. Observe the regulated speed. This is a densely populated area. Be careful how you ride. You can see the signpost. This is an area where you expect children to dash out any moment into the road. While they are on the wheel, guiding them, I'll be satisfied with that so that they grow to attain excellence in that act of driving. I believe I'm communicating. This is what I want the senior advocates of Nigeria to accept as a role for now that the outcome of the election, I mean the way it has come with a person who is not a senior advocate. At the same time, I expect the leadership of the bar to be conscious of the fact that the traditional respect in the bar must be observed. You must be conscious when the father sitting at the back seat telling you on the wheel that it's time for you to apply your brakes. It's time for you to negotiate this bend with care and caution. Yesterday, early morning, I opened my handset and I saw a message from my son. Baba will be on Liberty TV today, 7 a.m. And then I responded, on what topic? I hope it's consistent with your position as a public officer. 
do not go within the realm of inflamed political issues. He responded to me by saying so, about the topic is to do with issue of rape and domestic violence. I shortly replied, go for it. He only responded. <laughs> and so he went. That is what I mean by sitting at the back seat, guiding them to growth. When I see aged people sleeping at the Senate or House of Reps contributing nothing, when they have young ones at their constituency to promote, to go there and be vibrant and contribute, I feel, I feel. So when he returned, I saw the way he sat at the, he sent photographs, crossing legs. I sent him a message. I said, acting big man. <laughs> and he said, without money. I said, well, that's all right. I'm trying to promote the intellect, to give him that atmosphere of expressing his potentials. If I'm to shout, you know, intimidating him, he will not be coming forth. This is how it should be. I expect the leadership of the Nigeria Bar to be conscious of the fact that we are leaders of the Bar in the nature of senior advocates of Nigeria, either within the inner Bar or the outer Bar or within the official dome or in private, they are senior advocates of Nigeria and they deserve to be respected. When they come up with counseling, it should be readily embraced. We should not allow divisions and collapse of the Nigeria power, particularly at the center. We can recall what happened at Watakot. It took very, very long time. I remember, I recall how my Lord Honorable Justice Akambi and others had to come around after a long period of stage of decay within the unity bar, I mean the, 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 the MBA, to bring them back together. So let us not drift back into that state, particularly at this time. I had the privilege of sitting over disputes within the FCT, the unity bar. At one time, Olmec's election will not hold. So I was made to preside over a committee from, up by so many senior advocates and other lawyers. The war impacts, I was able to bring them together and the election held and Francis Mende. We had the same thing in Buari. I was also asked to address the issue. And so we mended Francis and peace reign. We must not allow this to. <laughs> we must be willing to take advice from more experienced persons. Coming back now, to the menu. And by this, looking at the age, the bracket age of the participants, young lawyers, it reminds me of a book dedicated to the late Ibi Ronke, senior advocate of Nigeria of blessed memory. The book was intended to be presented to the public at his 70th birthday. Unfortunately, he died before the date meant for the presentation. Now, chapter four of that book, I wrote the book, I wrote the chapter four of that book, Modern Bar Advocacy, of course, my first day in court on part of the topic. I dwell extensively on what is obtaining these days, which is not in your best interest as young lawyers. When we were there, either on law firm attachment or in private practice when we started, all case files were discussed in chambers. So that the day Mr. A who is handling a particular file is not there, each one can go there and go ahead with the case. So that the issue of unnecessary adjournment will not be there. But in that chapter, I discussed this syndrome of 
my principal asked me to come only and take date. I'm brief only to come and take date. You are being reduced to professionals only in taking dates. Ordinary motion or notice, you are asked to go and say my principal is clearly interested in this matter. He has only asked me to come and take date. You will not be allowed to prosecute motions. You won't go into serious cases because hide and seek game is there within the chambers. What is there? Does it take the interest of the principal in terms of fiduciary interest if you go there on your own to prosecute the matter? That is entirely between him and the client. You won't even know. But the interest of justice must prevail so that once you are there, the matter progresses. You must not, you must learn. Be curious, be show the enthusiasm that you want to learn. Not to be instrument of taking dates. It's undoing you. You are not making name, you are not picking in good time, and this is the psychic with which you would go ahead even when you establish your chambers. Hey, go and just take dates. I'm like, I don't feel like going to court today. Who are you deceiving? The client, yourself, or being an instrument of befitting the course of justice because you know the public will not see you. You will only see the court. You say the court again has adjourned. And that's the impression you create to the client. It's the court. Not you. You are undoing yourself because in the long run, people will want to know that, will come to know that you are a non-performer. I wish I can, I'm in the position to provide a copy of that book each to you so that you can exhaustively see the weaknesses in the system since the abrogation of the decree then act that permitted uh, uh, practicing, okay, uh, permitting lawyers to start practicing the very day they came out from the Nigeria Law School. It was done with good intention, but unfortunately, it has graduated into state of halting, instrument of halting speedy trial when you are just pushed there to go and take that. You must insist you want to move into the realm of the matters. That is that. On the AJA and laws on corruptions, which are very central to our being here today. That was the beginning of my contact with Professor uh, Kimi, Akinsia George, and subsequently Dr. Ahmad Ali. The first time when the draft bill was dusted and uh, inputs were required to abduct, ab update preparatory to the presentation of same to the National Assembly. A workshop was organized at the FCT. We had discussions and thereafter I was drafted to go around the northern Nigeria and discuss with stakeholders as to the content of that bill. So we had magistrates and judges that assembled in Kano and uh, I addressed them, we discussed, and I came back and submitted my report. I never knew that much later in time I will be the person to be appointed for the purpose of advocacy on the floor of the National Assembly to have the bill passed into law. And again, after Professor Akinshe George eloquently addressed the workshop in the FCT and the internment, we now met again on the panel that was required as part of the mandate to ensure the passage of that bill. We were lucky to have had Dr. Ahmad Ali as chairman of Committee on Justice in the House of Representatives. He was all over the place, and uh, we thank God that he was there. He did everything humanly possible. Even when time was running against us, that assembly was almost coming to terminal point. We had to rush and ensure accomplishment of the assignment. And that is why 
when certain lapses are being observed with very detestable comments, I take my time calmly to tell people that, look, we had time constraints. If you look at the criminal code and the criminal procedure code, you will see the sequence in terms of area of jurisdictions as it relates to the magistracy, chapter by chapter, and in sequence, the same thing under the CPC, where the jurisdiction relates to the magistracy is there clearly stated, and also the high courts procedurally. But because of this time constraint, we do want to defeat that process, the tempo. It has to be passed. If you look at the AJA today, you are not likely to see that sequence, the, the elegance in the drafting, which would take you directly where this is what a magistrate is expected to do. And therefore, there is this confusion. So when I took the position at a point where the law under the AJA says the magistracy has power to give remand order, and uh, I took a different view. I know we had debated this uh, many times with Professor Akinshe, uh, Professor Deji, and many others. I said, no, that section is true, it's there. The magistracy has power to make order for remands, but it's circumspective. It's, it's, it's circumscribed where there is no high court judge in the matter. Because these are cases within the trial competence of the high court. And in the MCT where we had already fought to the last point, issue of the congesting the dockets of the magistracy in terms of holding charges, we don't want to go back into that. So I took the position that yes, the law says they have the power, but it's prescribed, I mean circumscribed. If you can find a high court judge within, definitely you should not go to take order from the magistracy. The idea of that law is in the absence of a high court judge and in order to insulate the defendants from being in protracted detention beyond the 48 hours as allowed under the law, then you should go to a magistrate court to get order for remand. There was fire on the mountain. People who went to demonstrate in Lagos, address presses, press conferences, send all sorts of things. But at the end of the day, they came to realize that that is the position. Constitutionally, you are required to arrange a defendant before a court of competent jurisdiction. That is the, the, the law. Before a court of competent jurisdiction, if you arrange that person, before a magistrate court, it's, it's not a competent jurisdiction for the purpose of trying the substantive matter. So, ideally, you should take even for the purposes of remand before that court that has jurisdiction to avoid this holding charge, which there are plethora of decisions from the highest court frowning against that. And unfortunately, most of the states that have not adopted, or the few, are still grappling with this holding charge. It might go around the, state, the country on this, the congestion exercise. I've seen a lot. People staying 18 years in prison before, because a magistrate had given order for remand on a case that he has no jurisdictional competence to try. He didn't bother by his diary to note and take action that he had given remand order. The, the, the Correctional Service Center never alerted the chief judge that these people had been there. Even the lawyers that represented the prosecution, they were not there, they didn't bother. And when we inquired what was the offense, we realized if they had been convicted, they would have since served the, the prison terms and, and gone. We discharged them there and then. So we don't, we don't, you can't see that in the FCT. And to give biting teeth to, teeth to practice direction rooted in the, in the Aja, I went ahead and put in place rules that in the event of any magistrate
taking cognizance of an offense not within his trial competence, within two weeks, he must ensure that that case gets to the chief judge through the office of the chief registrar. I had risen and delightfully to address some of my brother heads of courts when I was going around the country to go by these so that people be reminded by the magistrates within those states we quickly go to the chief judge for the purpose of directing the cases to the relevant judges with competence to try them. This is how you can defeat holding child. Now, you can see that, as already said elaborately by the land prof, the Aja is indeed a revolutionary. Now, the purpose we are doing here is for you to be exposed on the very intentment behind this act. It's not the issue of how much you get from your clients, but how much are you able to promote the integrity of the justice delivery system in Nigeria? That is the most important thing. One professor, I can show you, was involved in these preliminary things from the outset in conjunction with Olujimi SAN. The, the, the driving force was no money. And when we came in later on, the driving force was not money. At best, we get some tea and coffee and move during break. But we are desirous of putting in place a regime that will earn respect, not only within this country for that justice delivery system, but in internationally. That is the passion which you are here today to have same promoted in you. The intent of the act on the face of it is to start operating with the, within the federal court as said by Professor Akinshe Jai. But practically, the intent goes beyond the federal capital. And that is why at the time of deliberating about the bill, we made sure that representation from the various component states of the Federation, at least by a director from the Ministry of Justice, if the Attorney General or the Solicitor General may not be able to attend. And we were successful at that. Some DPPs were there, some agents were there, some of them sent directors, and they form part of the committee that deliberated extensively on the bill, meaning we are able to sell the philosophy behind the bill so that when it is passed into law, adoption by those respective states will not be difficult because they are part and parcel of the process of discussing the bill to appreciate the jurisprudential significance behind the bill and then, of course, the act ultimately. And that is today more than 31, or 31 exactly, of the component states of Nigerian state have already adopted the bill with some modifications uh, to suit their local environment or to suit their financial abilities. I say financial abilities because some are complaining their governors are not in the position to engage more lawyers, and therefore they will still have to retain policemen, prosecutors, as lay as they could be, not necessarily the educated, I mean the, the lawyers amongst them, they will still have to retain lay policemen prosecuting until such a time they are able to get enough lawyers to ease them out. But in the FCT, the very day it was passed, I took a position that will no longer allow lay policemen to prosecute in any court in the FCT. Okay, uh, I, I think uh, I, 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 should, I should stop at this point. I never, I know that's all right. Um, but uh, I, I thought if there is an appeal mechanism uh, or a complaint mechanism, I would allow because from the outset I was not told that I'm, I'm timed. Uh, so I was not given time frame. But all the same, because we just have to go into the main money that brought us, I thank you so much for the opportunity.